thank you so much for joining me today. I know, I, I know you've been in the tourism industry for a very long time. Perhaps you could tell me who you are, how you got involved in the tourism industry in the first place. So my name is uh, Lindy Ware Sangweni Sido. And yes, I've been in the industry um, forever. I, I studied hotel management a good 30 some years ago. So when I was um, at the end of what we called, because I lived out of South Africa and I was living in Kenya and I was studying my A-levels. So that was the British system. So when I was at the end of my A-levels, I decided instead of following a medical route, which my parents would have preferred, I was going to join the hospitality industry. I was just obsessed with hotels and the glam and that's what I wanted. So I went to study hotel management in Switzerland um, I have a, a diploma in hotel management. And then I, I went and, and continued in the United States at uh, Penn State University. And I did a Bachelor of Science in hotel, restaurant and institutional management. So that, that was my background in terms of qualifications. I started working in South Africa um, following um, a short stint in the U.S. working for the Hyatt, the Hyatt Group. So having worked for the Hyatt Group in America for about three years, I joined the, it was called the Park Hyatt in Rosebank. And so my hospitality um, sort of um, career in South Africa was launched in Rosebank at the Park Hyatt. Um, and from there, I joined government, believe it or not. Um, so seven years after working for Hyatt, I went into government for a year. Um, but that was really interesting because I was um, in the Department of Tourism. I was the chief director for tourism support, so my portfolio um, oversaw South African tourism and just tourism support, as it was called. But it was a short stint. I don't think I was cut to be a public servant. Um, and I was lured back into the industry as general manager for Intercontinental. So then, you know, from there, um, went and started my own business. I opened a hotel in Soweto, the Soweto Hotel and Conference Center, Labor of Love. Um, I still feel like, you know, those parents who just never stop parenting and the baby never grows and it's just forever a labor of love. So that was Soweto Hotel. Um, but after the World Cup, around about 2011, I got um, back into sort of more formal employment. So moved away from, from business. I, I never stopped the Soweto Hotel. I, I carved out a different path for that, but went into Birchwood as the MD there. Um, and that was amazing working in a conference uh, um, sort of um, focus, which was not something I had done before, 660 some rooms and lots and lots of conferencing. Um, and that was just prior to now where I am. Five years ago, I joined City Lodge Hotel Group and I'm currently the chief operating officer for City Lodge Hotel Group. So my background is hospitality. But I do like to call myself a hospitality and tourism player because you can't be in hospitality if you don't have the big picture view. And I think that's what working in government did for me. It really opened my eyes and made me realize that you've got to understand the macro picture. You've got to understand the micro picture. You've got to understand why people travel, why people need to use hotels or airlines or restaurants and so on. You've kind of touched on it, uh, you know, without me actually even having to ask you, but perhaps you could unpack it a little bit more. We see the tourism industry quite often as a kind of palm tree, pina colada, holidays, and actually there's so many different facets to tourism, which you yourself in your career have experienced, the corporate side, the meeting side, uh, why people actually travel. Tell me a little bit about that, the travel industry's complexity and, and how it has so many different forms to it. Yeah, and, and, and I think in South Africa in particular. So, you know, having, having worked in my earlier years in, the, in Europe and in the US, it's just very natural for the inhabitants or citizens of a country to, to get on a bus or to get on a train or onto a low-cost airplane and vacation, as the Americans would call it, or take a holiday, as the French would do. You know, the French are known for having secondary homes because in the summer they close up their city homes and they, they travel and go to the countryside. South Africa, I think, is complex because of its social system that is historic. So you, on the one hand, have uh, individuals who can travel very easily, um, and they do it easily because they're resourced. They have the money. So come 
a holiday or come um, children's vacation or holiday uh, time, there is a plan to go somewhere, to close the house, lock up and get into the four by four or to get onto a low cost flight or whatever it is and go to the Kruger National Park. Whereas we have in South Africa also a lot of individuals who've never left Johannesburg or never left Cape Town or never left Durban if that's their place of abode. And I think the complexity in South Africa is for us to continue trying to get domestic tourism to be vibrant. Um, and COVID has woken us up to that. COVID has brought that realization to us that we're not going to get any form of travel if we don't crank up the machine for domestic tourism. And therein lies the complexity you allude to. How do we get people who didn't naturally travel or even worse now, don't have the resources, you know, um, I don't have a job anymore, it could be the problem that an individual has, or my wallet is much, much thinner, and I need to focus on necessities and traveling is, is not so important. Coming to business, business travelers currently, um, with the COVID pandemic, are also um, stifled by businesses going belly up or businesses having to be, you know, um, brought honed in because of the expense base that cannot support lack of revenues. Um, so those are just some of the complexities, Natalia, that I think are thrown in our face currently. Mm, and also we're having a meeting now on Zoom, whereas we might have had a face-to-face -face meeting if we were not living in the time of COVID. So there's, there's all of that that has to be brought into yeah. the land. <laughs> we, we, would have, we would have planned where to meet which hotel it was going to be, and is it lunch, or are we going to have coffee and tea and exactly. a slice of cake? Exactly. Of <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, as somebody who, who's been in all these different areas of the tourism industry and knowing that we're living in a very different time and, and potentially will carry on living in a very different time after the COVID pandemic is, has subsided somewhat, what do you think we would need to do as tourism stakeholders to reimagine what tourism looks like so that we do appeal for that domestic market that does have the ability to travel and we keep that business here as opposed to letting them go elsewhere in the world uh, and experience other destinations. What do we need to change? I, I think um, the first focus is trust. COVID-19 has brought a lot of fear to all of us. You and I probably think three times before we decide if we're going to do online shopping or get in the car and go and buy that loaf of bread and the essentials that we need. So bringing trust to the traveler, be it um, whether I'm going to get onto the Khao train or get into an airplane or check into a hotel. And the trust comes with all the protocols. So I think as South Africa, we need to really all come together and look at it as not being an um, issue of competition. It's in my interest to make sure that my fellow hoteliers are all following the protocols. And as a result, TBCSA, FedHasa, has pulled us together under one roof. And even though we've all got our little protocols going on in each of our establishments, we've put together one na national protocol document that says this is what's needed. So building the trust so that we can become a trusted site, a trusted destination. Um, when we eventually get back to international um, travel, other countries are going to first say, mm, is South Africa number five on the list in terms of number of cases and deaths? And that in itself needs to be addressed. So all of us understanding the role we have to play in, in those very, it seems very sort of like on the side, but it's such a central part of everything that needs to take place. Do your staff behave, um, um, you know, in a safe manner? Um, do all of us endorse and make sure that we stick to the rules of, of protocols? Once that is aside, I think the issue of price, pricing is going to be a big part that we need to look at. Now, on the one hand, we don't want to get into a situation where we have price wars where we start fighting for the same client by dangling this lower price. Everything should continue to be for value for money. Um, businesses should still be able to be able to make some sort of decent margin in order to justify existence and to be able to pay back all those onerous uh, loans that we're taking out currently to survive this pandemic. So pricing um, and dynamic pricing, pricing that takes into consideration that, as I said earlier, 
the client's wallet is becoming far much thinner and dis disposable income is, is not so um, available. Um, I think beyond that then is just innovation, innovation and creativity, where we really stretch the imagination and begin to um, look at what else we can do differently. You mentioned how you and I are having this meeting um, virtually. We used to think that was a, if you like, we'll do it, but let's still drive and see each other. So we need to accept that more and more is going to happen virtually because it's more convenient, it's less expensive. Therefore, what does that leave us um, in terms of what we sell? We'll be selling space, not necessarily rooms. We'll be selling space and we'll need to imagine differently what a client would want to do in that space and move out of our typical mode, mode of this is the restaurant and this is the room mm -hmm. and this is the bar. Places will have to be um, just fluid. Um, in order to accommodate what the guest is looking for and what the client is looking for. So those are some of the thoughts that go through my mind in terms of where we're going in, in, you know, beyond this period. I love that idea of a kind of blank canvas and reimagining what hospitality should look like at this time and beyond. And, you know, it's, in an environment like this, you're kind of forced to be creative. When things are going well, you're not forced to be creative. You're not forced to grow. So I can see you also, you, you, you lit up when you were talking about this reinvention or reimagining. Is that what you love most about your job? Or what is it that you love so much about working in hospitality and tourism? I love anything that's new. Um, I get bored quickly and uninspired very quickly. Um, once an idea is out there and there are people to run with it and implement it and make it happen and dream it up and, and make it theirs, my mind is already racing to what next. Um, so, you know, for me, I'm inspired by, by, by change. COVID found me my voice. It's such a weird thing to say. In my own work environment, I found myself um, speaking differently and doing things differently and not being boxed into that corporate persona that we so much think we're supposed to fall into, especially as women this is the way you're supposed to behave in a corporate environment. You know, um, I think as a woman, um, we, 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 we know how to make a plan when it's time to make a plan. When, that, when, when you've got to make a choice between whether I'm going to do my hair, my nails, and buy a pot roast with 150 rands, we, we know how to make it happen. Um, I'll, I'll buy the stuff to uh, do my manicure at home and I'll look like it's uh, sorbet gel nails and um, I'll find something else that is absolutely delicious to feed my family without ever having to buy prime roast. Um, so we, we, we thrive on that, I think, as women. Um, and, and so this environment, I think, has made us understand you cannot be complacent. It's so fluid. In the morning, you wake up and this is what the rules are about COVID. In the evening, they tell you quarantining has moved from 14 to 10 days. That has a big impact on our business, if you think about it. A quarantine period has a big impact. You know, let me give an example. We, we um, look after guests who are traveling back from South Africa, from other countries coming back to South Africa. So they have to quarantine in our hotels. And um, we have a service level agreement with government to look after these individuals. When we first started, our service level agreement said, we will look after them for 14 days from the day they check in to the day they check out. Over time, the World Health Organization has discovered the quarantine pro process is no longer 14 days, it's now 10. And not only that, government has also realized we don't have this endless bank account to just keep paying hotels. Let's create some flexibility into it. Can't people go home and quarantine? So once that agreement with the guest has been worked out. Government says, you can check out. The doctor is giving you the go ahead, you can go home. Now, from a business point of view, that hurts me because my 14 days is now five days or two days. My 100 guests is now 40 guests. But all it does is it makes me think even harder. Where is my next guest going to come from? So that's what I mean about the sort of forever changing environment that I enjoy that makes and pushes me to think differently and creative, creatively to, to survive, to look after people's jobs and to look after our business.
How has the COVID lockdown impacted the women in your business, their livelihoods, their roles? Do you have any insights on that? I do. I, I, um, for Women's Day, I reached out to a circle of women because I thought, you know, this thing of Happy Women's Day, it's never really sat well with me. Happy about what? I'm not trying to be a party pooper. There's many things that make me happy and I'm a happy human being. But we, we should be careful not to fall into slogans that just become marketing um, um, sort of spiel of Happy Women's Day. So I reached out to women, um, not necessarily only in the tourism and hospitality industry, but by default, a lot of women I know are in that circle. Young women, um, women who I call my daughters, women who are colleagues. Um, and I also reached out to older women, my aunts and, and all of that, to, to, to ask different questions. I didn't ask about the impact of COVID but I asked what their struggles were. And from, from um, women who are in the hospitality industry, especially the younger women, there's a big question mark of, did I choose the right um, sort of industry? Did I choose the right sector? Did I make a mistake? Should I have been in something else? Um, and the other questions of how do I survive Many women are beginning to realize that they cannot survive on one job because remember, we also have had to take decisions like reductions in salaries. So if you are earning, as an example, 50% of your salary and your lifestyle was on 100% of your full income, you're now at, 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 um, you know, against a rock and a hard wall as a woman in terms of how to make ends meet. Your children are not going to school. Women have to juggle online schooling. They have to think about where that Wi-Fi and mobile data is going to come from and who's going to pay for it. They don't have the house um, help that they could have maybe afforded because their salaries have been halved. And so they have to do it themselves, so multitasking. Um, if they've got good partnerships in terms of, when I say good partnerships, understanding husbands and partners, they're good. But in many cases, I even discovered there's what's called single parenthood within marriage, within a supposedly happy marriage. But you're a single parent because you're doing everything. You're juggling all these roles as a woman um, of, I've got to get onto Microsoft Teams because we've got our morning meeting, but I've got to make sure that Sbongile is doing her online um, you know, lesson. Is Wi-Fi enough for both her and I? We're both you know, and does she have a laptop? Is she using mommy's laptop? Can you imagine the dilemma that women are facing? Um, many of the women I'm talking to, especially the younger ones, are, 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 are moonlighting. And I'm saying, don't call it moonlighting. Declare it. It's okay. Um, we can't expect you to have one job and make ends meet. Just make sure you understand that it's not in conflict with what you do that it doesn't conflict with your existing business. Make mature and careful decisions. But if you're going to start selling toilet paper because that's what's going to make you survive, do it. If you're gonna cater in the evenings or um, on the days you're not working and sell food and deliver it to people's homes because that's what you do best, do it. And that's the culture I grew up under, you know, 30 some years ago, we had two jobs or three jobs to make ends meet. And I think those are some of the things that I think women in particular are, are, are going through. They're, they're going through this struggle and they're also saying, therefore, what's the solution? Because I can't just sit here and cry over spilt milk. This looks like it's gonna be with me for a while. Therefore, how do I um, take it forward? I found it really interesting asking those questions and it's just very coincidental that you ask me what women are going through. Mm. You know, <laughs> Uh, it's been so inspiring speaking to the 31 women, I am tourism women, because they have all, they have all done moonlighting. They're all finding, looking at what they know how to do and how to be resourceful and employing that resourcefulness in a solution as opposed to sitting back and just giving up. But let's say we are talking to someone today that just does feel like there is no, there is no option, that there aren't resources available. What could you say to someone who is in that space at the moment to inspire them to look at what they do have on hand and to leverage that? Yeah, it's a very difficult space because um, 
this period also brings a lot of mental health and physical health um, issues. I would say, first of all, make sure that you look at your well-being. You, you cannot do anything and you're no good to anyone as a woman if you haven't looked at yourself. You've got to love yourself first. And you've got to stop the boat selfishly because you're doing it for others. But you must be well. Are you walking in the morning? So many of us aren't going to the gym anymore. anymore. Um, I find a lot of relief and pleasure in what I call my gratitude walks. Um, I learned a new form of exercise called Qigong just because I was surfing the net and I found out about this ancient um, Chinese or Asian um, art of, of exercise. Find something that gives you that time for yourself you might have to wake up earlier because, you know, before the entire family wakes up and starts yelling mom or, you know, whatever your name is in that household. Um, but well-being. Beyond well-being, I think what we've already touched on, your entrepreneurial side in you has got to be explored. We're all entrepreneurs at, 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 when you think about it. A woman in the rural areas is an entrepreneur because she's got to think about how to feed her family. And so she plants because that's what's at her disposal, a piece of land or a piece of, um, you know, a garden where she can plant cabbage and tomato because then she can feed her family. And if she has extra, she can sell it. And if she sells it, she can then buy a little bit more to augment what she needs. We've got to become entrepreneurial and we've got to um, understand that entrepreneurship is actually far much more dynamic, even if you are in a job, because you then bring that extra touch also to your job. Don't look at, you, at your job as a job where I arrive at eight and leave at five. Contribute to your company's innovation and creativity and think like it's your own business. Because if this business fails, you really don't have a job. And so you've got to contribute in that particular way. So entrepreneurship for me, is, is, is very important. And just the reality also that understand what COVID pandemic is all about. It's not going to go away. People talk about life after COVID or, you know, life, they call it the post COVID phase. We've all got to read a little more and understand more about this pandemic and understand scientifically what it means. And there's so much information out there. I'm not suggesting we become doctors, but Understanding that it's going to be a way of life to sanitize for the rest of your life. Like we buy a bar of soap um, for bathing purposes. We are going to have to put sanitizer on the shopping list, not as a luxury, but as a necessity. And therefore, there comes in how we're going to live. So what is it that I'm going to have to do to adapt and change? But in that, also understanding that I'm one day going to be able to live a, a life that is fulfilling that um, takes me back to a space where I can be in the space of others. Currently, we are virtually dealing with each other virtually. We do better, indeed, when we are physically in each other's spaces, physically able to hug. Um, women are feel, touch, do, taste uh, beings. And, and so my inspiration or, or words of inspiration are take, take a realistic view and look at this as a journey. Eventually, if you look at what's going on in a lot of countries that went through winter, we are in our winter and we're going into our spring, the COVID cases are going to come down. Um, the losses of human lives will diminish. It may not end forever. Remember, flu has been killing people, sadly, for many years. We've just never paid attention to it. We will continue then to live the lives that we would have wanted to enjoy. But the beauty of it is we'll be doing things on our terms. And if you make sure you've looked after your well-being, you've fed your entrepreneurial side, you've looked at the reality of what my life is going to be as a result of this COVID or new um, corona, you're able, I think, to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, try not to be that human being who wakes up looking at it all at once and putting it all on one plate. I'm a person who says, break it up. And when you break it up into small sizes and um, eat that elephant um, in bite sizes, you are able to um, achieve what it is that you desire eventually. And 
I think it will be wonderful when we look at where we came from, how we restarted our businesses, businesses that were very successful, um, that might have looked like they were on the brink of falling apart and you were part of building it. You actually put uh, your efforts and contributed to taking it to profitability again and success. That will be an accolade to you as being part of that team and part of that effort that uh, hung in there and saw it through. I love that. And, and you know, we, we think about, if we think about tourism as a business and making sure that tourism has a seat at the table as an industry that generates as many jobs as it does and, and the GDP that it does, I think second to mining. And yet I feel that tourism doesn't get the seat at the table that it deserves because it's seen as this kind of softer industry. But why is tourism important? Why is it important that we are involved in tourism, that we are entrepreneurial in entrepreneurially minded in the tourism industry? Why does it deserve to be saved? Well, it deserves to be saved because of where it was before COVID. Let's not forget, we, we were actually a very important part of the, the, the bigger plan. We were and have been recognized as a very important contributor to the growth, uh, to the GDP of this country. Um, if you think about the indirect impact that we have on the GDP, um, if you are in a hotel industry, you support manufacturing because curtains, uh, tablecloths, serviettes, and many other things need to be purchased from different industries. You support agriculture because of the food that you need to um, provide or supply. Um, you provide so many indirect jobs um, which become such an integral part. We were and have been targeted as the industry that will bring in 21 million tourists into this country by the year 2025 or 2030. 2030. And that in itself showed, shows us how important it is. So think about all the indirect jobs. Think about all the indirect industries, fishing industries, retail industries, manufacturing industries that depend on tourism. And then think about why it's so important for us to be uh, at the table. I think during COVID, we've tended to be the poor cousin, um, maybe because it was the tourism industry traveling and the connotation of traveling that um, spread the virus you know, coming from as far as China, across the seas, um, all the way down to little old South Africa. It took one, one trip to Italy by a group of 10 people. And we don't know if they were the ones. It could have been many other sources that brought it in. But travel has been really the reason for any spread, not only of corona, um, even of Ebola and many other diseases around the world. So maybe we've been dealt uh, an unfair blow, but we should take our table, uh, our space at the table, and we should continue to remember how many other industries are so dependent on us. Look at what's happened to um, the alcohol sector, um, wine, wine farms, uh, grape farms, wineries, um, the jobs that are affected just because alcohol is not being sold. A company called Consol, which produces the bottles and the glassware, is also going belly up purely because of tourism not functioning and the alcohol side of um, um, retail not, not, not currently functioning. So we, we do play a very important part. And I think we will go back to that. Um, we'll all come back a little bit more creative, bruised, yes, scarred, yes, um, having lost quite a lot along the way, yes. But I think in the next three to five years, we'll find ourselves in a far much more exciting space than we currently feel we're in.